psychologists share the creepiest mental conditions that they have ever seen. Before we even start with the topic of today, let us define what a mental illness is. According to the American Psychiatric Association, a mental illness is a health condition involving changes in emotion, thinking, or behavior. Or maybe it can be a combination of the three. Mental illnesses are associated with distress and or problems functioning in social, work, or family activities. According to the American Psychiatric Association, mental illness is common. In a given year, nearly one in five, which is roughly 90% of US adults, experience some form of mental illness. Nearly one in 24, which is 4.1%, has a serious mental illness, and one in 12, which is 8.5% has a diagnosable substance use disorder. Mental illness is treatable though. The vast majority of individuals with mental illness continue to function in their daily lives. With that information established and a context given and a framework properly stated, come with us and join us in this particular adventure in which we are going to know the personal experience of some people through YouTube comments. Before we even start, we would like to thank Radio TTS for providing the content for the following video. Take a seat, grab a drink, probably grab a snack, and come with us into this journey of stories. Former foster child here. Reactive attachment disorder sucks. I have it. It isn't just a childhood thing. No, it lasts forever. When I make friends, they are automatically my best friends, even if I've known them for less than a day. I'm extremely codependent, helpless and scared of everything. I was one of the lucky few adopted into my first foster home that I had been with since I was three months old. The neglect I faced in the first 19 days of my life destroyed a massive part of me. 90 days. That's all it takes to ruin a person's mind for their entire life. I am not a psychologist, but I had my undergrad internship in a mental facility. Most of the patients who I handle had tragic stories, but one in particular stuck with me the most. There was this patient that was admitted at the age of 18. He was 23 years old when I handled him. He was really soft-spoken and was always pleasant to be around with. The first time I talked to him, he talked me about how he felt bad about his younger brother because of how their father would beat them every night and blame them for causing their mother some timely death, and how their uncle had molested and raped his brother when his brother was only 10 years old. When his brother talked to their father about what their uncle was doing, their father locked him, the brother, in the basement for three days with no food or water whatsoever. By the time they were 13, their father died, and the uncle who had been molesting them became their guardian. I was curious as to why he was still admitted at the institution, seeing how he interacts with his fellow patients. The doctors, the nurses, and all the other staff at the facility, he seemed recovered and was adapting fairly well. My heart broke in pieces when I read his chart. It turns out that he did not have a younger brother. Everything that his younger brother went through was actually what had happened to him. I cried myself to sleep that night, and I wish his uncle is suffering every minute of his miserable life. <sighs> oh. 
Who else is fed up with people in the world trying to romanticize mental illness and trauma in media? You know, such as books, movies, and other story-driven forms of art? You know, I feel totally horrible for all these victims, and I may relate to them on an emotional scale to an extent. Uh, you know, I can understand stories showing the roller coaster of living some with mental disorders. But stories that basically says, oh my god, that guy eating that lady's face while cutting himself is so hot, makes me want to stick them in an asylum so that they see what it is really like. <sighs> it is so frustrating. The third time I was in a mental hospital, there was a girl. She was just 14 years old and she was already suffering from schizophrenia. She was always walking around the ward, 24-7, not communicating with the other patients. Then sometimes she would just stop in their tracks, stare at something I obviously couldn't see or talk with. She had a bad breakdown once where she screamed that she would get revenge on mankind and that they had destroyed her. I felt so bad for her, but then over time she got better and started talking with us, participated in some things, and was once allowed to visit her home. It was nice to watch the progress. Similar to capgrass, I have a rare type of obsessive compulsive disorder called Pure O. Before we continue with the following story, let us define quickly what crabgrass is. According to Ellis and Lewis, capgrass delusion is a psychiatric disorder in which a person holds a delusion that a friend, spouse, parent or other close family member or even a pet has been replaced by an identical imposter. It is named after Joseph Crabgrass, Capgrass, which who was a French psychiatrist who lived from 1873 to 1950. Back to the story. The person that this posters, the disease that this person is suffering from, is called pure O, meaning that his OCD is purely based around intrusive thoughts and obsessions. No real outward compulsions to anyone who doesn't understand. Intrusive thoughts creep into your mind, and they include, at least for me, everything disgusting and horrible that you would ever want to do or think about. It convinces you that those are your thoughts, and that you are a terrible person. For example, I had months upon months of believing that I'm a pedophile and I want to hurt my dog, and I don't love my boyfriend, and that... I'm a psychopath that could hurt anyone without feeling it. That's not true, and I know it's not, but it convinces you, as it goes above logic. It's truly terrifying, and you live in shame, every day being scared of yourself and wondering if you are going to hurt someone, as well as trying to avoid any possible triggers. I became a hermit in my house. I became totally isolated, because home I knew was kind of safe for the most part. The outside world was far too unpredictable. I almost ruined my wonderful relationship with my boyfriend. I felt like I was on the verge of psychosis because it's so hard to tell what thoughts are real. And it's crazy because so few people have heard of pure O oh before. But so many suffer in silence because they are too, as they are too ashamed and don't even know that they have the disorder. Hopefully, this comment can help someone realize that what they are going through is a valid disorder and they are not the devil incarnate. And trust me, medication changed my life. It helps so much. What makes all of this totally creepy is because abnormal behavior is scary to humans. It's similar to the uncanny valley. The person seems human, but the behavior is too abnormal. 
We don't know how to behave, feel or act in the presence of humans who aren't normal. It can be very benign, such as talking to an eccentric person, but as soon as it becomes more intense, more different and more harmful, it's very uncomfortable for us. I find this interesting too also because I'm not sure if the behavior feels creepy for the people doing it themselves. I talk to myself all the time and I'm generally pretty crazy, but I don't act out in public. I think if people saw me, they would probably describe me in worse terms than I'd, uh, I would probably use myself. Maybe. It's scary from the outside because we can't see the other person's thoughts or feelings. If we knew the underlying feelings and thoughts, the external behavior would seem more logical and less startling to observe since we might spec such behavior. Basically, we fear the unknown because evolutionary speaking, it's potentially fatal. The insomnia thing, oh man. I've been suffering from severe insomnia myself, to a point where I frequently just can't sleep for over a week. Hallucinations kick in, and eventually I'm barely getting through the days. Ultimately, I collapse from exhaustion, and I sleep for around 5 hours if I'm lucky. One of the few chances I do sleep, any sound or even the headlights from the occasional passing car will wake me up. Once that happens, I can forget about getting any more sleep for a while to come. It's gradually been getting worse too. I'm the only one in my family, to my knowledge, who suffers from this. It is rather unsettling to know that my insomnia may eventually kill me. While I was in a psychiatric ward as a kid, it was rather dope, but at the same time, it was pretty dark. Lots and lots of the people were smiling and joking around, so you would think that they were totally fine. However, as soon as they pull up their sleeves, you would see hundreds and hundreds of close together cuts and stitches. When we had group therapy, everyone's personality flipped and people had these issues that you would have never guessed that they had, like being sexually abused, physically abused and eating disorders and it's not like it was something mild, you know, simple problems. They were affected by them with a severe, severe psychological pain. It was so sad seeing that switch in people. You were playing Uno with like 10 minutes ago, by the way. This comment was getting a bit of recognition so I just want to say something to all of the mentally challenged fellows out there. Things do get better. Things do get better. You might not believe it. I don't even believe me either. But things do change in fact. When I was in third grade, I always used to think my mom was replaced by someone identical to her and that there were an army of women that looked like her, that the army was holding her hostage and wanted to kill me. I always thought it was a weird child's imagination, but is it an actual disorder? And the following person with the following comment, it's kind of provide an answer to this person. I had cap grass delusion occasionally for a good chunk of my childhood. I've always lived alone with my mom. When I was around 6 to 12, I thought they replaced her with an actress because I could see clearly the way she looked differently. And she lost all the kindness in her eyes. 
When I realized that they had killed my old mother, I would always start crying. I thought my fake mother's mission was to kill me and she was going to succeed eventually, only waiting for a moment where I would misbehave so she could blame it on me. I think my first panic attack might have been capgrass related. My fake mother was hired by an organization more powerful than God and she did this routinely. I think the worst thing about it is having to suffer in silence, not being able to tell anyone how terrified and miserable I felt in this situation. My mother was dead and I thought I was going to die, but I had no one to call for help. So I just kept it to myself until eventually one day I woke up and I forgot about everything. I remembered it years later.